first, somebody? No, um, Shanika is trying to get in touch with him. Okay. I hope he's not just working like the last time. I, I <laughs> a lucky man, a lucky man indeed. Yeah, it's such a critical role. We good to have him in from the beginning. All right, so we are ready to go. We call, we start when we're ready. So let's give it a, no, we're not, we're starting now. <laughs> uh, just one thing before you start. Uh, Josefina is a member of the organizing committee, so please do not consider her as a member of the panel. Thank you. We will start now because we have been enabled as interpreters. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a very warm welcome uh, to celebrate World Food Day and FAO's 75 years in the Caribbean and Latin American region doing strong work with our national partners along the way. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bree Rommelt. I am a value chain development specialist working for FAO's sub-regional office for the Caribbean. I am currently based here in Kingston, Jamaica, where most of my panelists are as well, who I will introduce to you shortly. Um, for, but for the, you know, for the efforts of getting going, I'm a firm believer in punctuality. Let us, let us kick off now. Um, we are very grateful to have this opportunity to present some very interesting work that's going on in the ground um, here in Jamaica regarding the ginger sector. Um, the main theme, of course, of the, of the bigger three-day World Food Day FAO com um, commemoration event is with regard to, of course, the only major topic of this year, which is the COVID pandemic um, that has been unfolding around us now for close to a year with still no end in sight. I think it's fair to say that it has been um, a 2020 that we were not expecting. Nonetheless, it has put a huge amount of stress on our food systems. Um, and our food systems in the Caribbean that even at the best of times remain vulnerable. Um, and I think that is the very challenge of agriculture and that is the very challenge of what we're doing here today. Agriculture is a risky business. It is exposed to a lot of elements, pests and diseases, climate change, to market and price fluctuations and to the wrath of mother nature. And then on top of all of that now to COVID. Moreover, given that 80% of our farmers in the Caribbean are small farmers with around one acre or less, um, we also find that it is our most vulnerable that bear the heavy burden of this risk day in, day out. So while we talk about food systems today and the ginger value chain, um, I do want to remind us all that food and agriculture are, deal, are still deeply human endeavours. So in line with the theme of the main event this week on how to recover and transform agri-food systems in the region post COVID-19, I don't think there's any disagreement between um, all, of the, all of us working in this field um, that we need to build back better and we need robust and resilient food systems that can manage um, and mitigate the risks that are being thrown at it. What is often, however, lacking or perhaps a little less vocal in these discussions and debates is how we actually do that. How, how do we actually get these kind of work and this rebuilding um, operational on the ground? And I think that is the true challenge we face. So how do we move from lofty words of action to actually concrete steps? So that's exactly why we are enthusiastic and energetic about our webinar today, because we think we have um, a good case study to show you how to get things moving on the ground. We are experimenting with a new and innovative approach um, that's applicable not just to ginger, not just to Jamaica, but what we to think to all crops and agriculture in the region, perhaps even further afield. Let's see how it goes. Um, 
Nonetheless, we are here today to talk about Ginger because it is an excellent case study for COVID. Now, admittedly, this partnership between the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries in Jamaica began back in 2017. So that was well before COVID. Um, but I think it's frank and, and clear to say that it has been an industry in crisis over the last decade. So I think it's a very pertinent lesson um, that we can we can share the work in rebuilding ginger um, as a very valuable lesson in terms of COVID recovery as well. So in this case, it's not just about how to rebuild the ginger industry back to what it once was in the past, but how to actually put it up on a new and upgraded trajectory for the modern, um, for the future, basically. So today and our discussion with my panelists is just really an opportunity to share concrete ideas. We want to have a pragmatic webinar to show you the transformation step by step. And I will reiterate, it is a process. It is step by step. It's week in, week out. And But now I can see just after three years work that we have put um, this metaphoric ginger plane onto uh, the runway and it is ready for takeoff. So the we hope that you can take away from this webinar some clear lessons um, of how to transform agricultural sectors. And I'll be very clear and pragmatic with you. We, by the end of this webinar, um, we hope that you should have some ideas or uh, perhaps even some answers on the following questions. How do you actually systematically conquer a pest and disease issue that has been crippling not only farmers but their livelihoods for way too long? How do we actually get not only to introduce next, next new technologies into the agricultural sector, but convince farmers to use them, to absorb them in their day-to-day -day business? How do we actually go about forging partnerships with the private sector? What are the first steps? How do we walk that path? And how do we as industry actors in it, from our different hats, whether it's the ministry or other development agencies to the private sector, how do we work together? How do we stop working in isolated pockets and come together for meaningful collaboration? So with those introductory words, and again, an, a very warm welcome to all of those who are joining us today to listen to this discussion, um, I would like to introduce you, to you my esteemed panel. Um, I would like to start uh, with Mr. Goslan McCook, who is the Acting Director General of the Jamaica Agricultural Commodities Regulatory Authority. That is the agency that has the mandate for development of the not only the ginger industry here in Jamaica, but also the spices. Welcome. Uh, Mrs. Sherwood, Mrs. Michelle Wood, Sherwood, Deputy Director of Research at the Research and Development Division of the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. Mm -hmm. Greetings, welcome, great to have you here. Turning to Dr. Sarah with the incredibly difficult name to, to say out loud, um, but Professor Sarah Vanakuma, also more commonly known as Dr. Sarah, is our expert in, um, in ginger, all the way from India, but currently working at the University of West Indies St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago. And finally, last but not least, um, who is still joining us, Mr. Carlton Samuels, who is our private sector representative. Um, he represents agro industry and agro um, processing, the part of the value chain we also very much want to encourage and build out on. And he is going to share with us from his company's perspective, Caribbean flavors and fragrances, their interest in moving forward in the ginger development work. Okay, let's get into it. The structure of our webinar today will be as follows. Um, on behalf of the group, um, I will do a presentation of about 15 minutes to give you some background information and give you an overview of the work that we've been doing in the ginger sector. I hope that that can lay the foundations so that for our discussion then we can dive deeper into the more interesting and nuanced parts of this work. Once I finish my presentation, um, we will then have an opportunity for each of our panelists to make some opening remarks and share their perspectives on this work. As you might have noticed from my introduction, everyone is located in a different part of the value chain, some in R&D, some expertise in production, some at the agro-processing level and some with the overall strategic mandate. So everybody's perspective is very interesting when we see it in the whole. Once we've finished with opening remarks, then we turn the floor over to you. If you have questions, comments, reflections, we are here to discuss. We want an interactive debate. So what I would encourage you to very much do is use the um, YouTube comment box to put in your questions. We are monitoring that box and we'll take them accordingly. Um, and then we'll throw them out to the panelists for their responses. 
So um, in the last bit of housekeeping, please note that our this webinar is being recorded. It will be available on this website um, following the event for you to share, revisit, whatever you wish. Please spread the word. But with that, I think it's time that we get down to business. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now and tell you a little bit about the work we've done in Ginger. Okay. So again, with a bit of context um, to the bigger um, event that's playing out right now um, with FAO's Commemoratorium, of course, we are all working together in terms of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, um, we are working, FAO has a new strategic framework, um, with, which has an emphasis on accelerators. So how do we actually speed up progress to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals? Interesting on this is for poignant cogs. Let's start with red. Technology. Technology at the production level, tech, digital agriculture, all the different modes of which we can boost productivity. Innovation. So now not just hard innovation, but also tacit soft innovations. How can we work differently to achieve better outcomes? Data. I'm a huge proponent of data. Data, you will see from this presentation, we've, we are in a process of ongoing collection and analytics of ginger sector data. This work, whether it's farm gate prices, cost of production, production volumes, um, a huge R and D results, we are constantly collecting data, and that has enabled us to be able to intervene very strategically. I often say that if you are a surgeon, um, you cannot do surgery in the dark and data is, is what turns the light on. It can help us really intervene more effectively. And finally, in this last accelerator is the complement section. And that is a really interesting component of this work with regards to the human side of things, the institutional arrangements, the frameworks, um, the governance structures to bring everything together. So four accelerators all together in, our, in the FAO's new strategic framework. So... Why Jamaican ginger? Of all crops, of all Caribbean countries, why are we focused on this? Well, I think this is, this is it. The work that's being underway in ginger for the last two to three years now has exemplifies using four components, four cogs of the wheel, and getting the whole machine to start working roundedly. What is the problem? For those of you who aren't aware of the ginger Jamaica sector, I just put this slide up as a way to demonstrate the problem in its totality. I often ask people, what are the two things all of these products have in common? I frequently get back the response, well, they're all value-added products, which is great. It's not just shipping out um, ginger in its prime form, but there's been these products have been transformed, values being created, beverages, food, even into up here the health and wellness market. They also have in common that Jamaican branding is very prevalent and very obvious on all of their labelling. They also have two other things in common, and that is the fact that none of these products are made by Jamaican com companies, and neither, none of them are made by Jamaican ginger farmed by our farmers. Yes, this is a problem in terms of intellectual property rights, but from a trade and markets perspective, this also represents huge market potential that's not being filled by Jamaican farmers and Jamaican companies, and instead, you know, not perhaps rightly so, but international companies are taking advantage. Jamaica has a very long history. I mean, sorry, ginger has a very long history in Jamaica and has been a very successful industry. Prior to the 1960s, was considered one of the top three producing nations in the world. Um, was exporting extremely large volumes from a very small country. So this was significant. Now, Jamaica, for those who don't know, is also renowned for um, a high quality ginger. There is something about the soils in this country that is creating a high, higher pungency and a very um, favoured taste profile. Jamaican ginger commands a higher price in premium markets and niche markets. So it has an excellent competitive advantage in terms of quality, or so we hear. So what is the problem? Well, this is kind of the problem in figures. We have a production base in decline. So this is the number or the volume of ginger being produced in Jamaica over the last uh, eight or so years. And what we can see from a high in about 2014 of over 6,000 metric tonnes, we have now dropped drastically to over 3.5 metric tonnes. So that's a, that's a production decline of almost 50%. 
And given that that yellow line up there represents the actual total demand for ginger just in Jamaica, we can see that there is a huge market gap, about 3,000 metric tonnes in total. Why? Well, sorry, before I get to why, not only did we look at international demand, we also quantified total estimated demand for Jamaican ginger every year. That was for fresh, processed, local markets and international markets. And what we're seeing is a demand of over 16,000 metric tonnes per year. The country, our farmers, are producing 3.5, you know, 3,500 metric tonnes. So we aren't even fulfilling 20% of the annual demand. This is a huge wasted opportunity um, and a wasted opportunity for livelihoods for everybody involved in the value chain. Why? And that's what I was getting to. Well, this is our core problem. This is the spread of a nasty rot, the ginger rhizome rot that has gone across the country. When, uh, when ginger gets infected, it has the potential of decimating farmers' fields um, and the spread, unfortunately, of this disease has been because of unsustainable farming practices or poor practices at the farm level by our farmers, as well as a tradition of exchanging planting material between farmers, and in some cases, unbeknownst, sharing infected materials, which are then getting into clean soil and infecting clean soils. So what we've in effect has seen is the spread of this rot across all the major production parishes or areas in the country, which has been highly concerning. Now, that supply side crash or the spread of the rhizome rot has led to obviously the first point of call is a decreasing yield rate. From 1965, up around 21 metric tonnes per hectare down to 14 metric tonnes, you know, which is about the same rate today, we see a major drop off. Now, this is very concerning for farmers because it means for each acre that they plant, they will reap less and have less to sell. So it is having a major impact on farmer livelihoods. As a result, what we are seeing, farmers are getting out of ginger production. If it's becoming too risky to manage the disease and we ca they can't be guaranteed about what they're going to harvest at the end of the production cycle, they are getting out and moving into other crops. This in turn contributes to a supply side that is crashing or in major decline. Now, basic economics, as soon as supply goes down because our farmers are leaving the sector and demand remains robust, what we do see is a farm gate price that is going up impressively. So from $200 back in 2015, Jamaican dollars that is per kg, right up to over double, well to about double, over double at uh, 500 in 2017. This is a concern um, because it means that as price goes up, um, producing all those good value-added products, ginger teas, ginger beers, by local processes in Jamaica, it is becoming not cost-effective to source ginger locally. Instead, now, now turning to imports. So what we see is the demand for locally grown ginger by local processes has decreased because the price is just getting too high. So what I've, what I've pitched to you is a story we're seeing in ginger, but I ask you, is this, is this a familiar story? What we can see in many crops, not only here in Jamaica, but also other across the Caribbean is this is quite a familiar story. We have productivity issues and problems at the production base. We can't get enough supply. Processors can't get a consistent supply to invest in the industry. There's low value addition and so begins a vicious cycle. Hence, our teamwork and what we're presenting today is a way and a new approach that we have been applying to, to change this, to convert this around and really tackle this for the long run sustainability of the sector. So what is this new approach? Well, this is a very quick um, and simple diagram of what is the ginger value chain. We start with inputs going into production, farmers producing ginger, transporting it, then in some cases would go to processing market and then previously, well in the past, it would go to export. So obviously we can see we have really major issues at the input and production level that are deeply affecting the rest of the chain. As a result, we're having problems at the processing levels. Processors aren't investing in local sourcing anymore. And what we can see is imports have increased. And that of course is costing the country um, 
foreign exchange and also means we're importing Indian or Chinese ginger to feed into our local industry when we could be feeding into this industry itself. So we need a few solutions here. And what we're proposing is an integrated selection of solutions. First, on the production side, we really need to tackle this rhizome rot issue. So that is what we are heavily focused on. It is a complex intervention, more complex than other sectors. It involves four components and each component on themselves is not necessarily new. The game changer is bringing them all together at once. We start with tissue culture from, and produce clean planting material based on the local Jamaican renowned varieties. We then, in order to make sure that once the tissue culture leaves the labs and goes into the nurseries and then into the farmer's fields, we need to make sure that clean planting material stays clean. So a certification system, which is basically a quality assurance system along the full length of production to ensure, check every step of the way that the ginger remains, remains clean and the, and the right agricultural practices are being applied by the farmers to keep it that way. In addition to this, and as many of you may know, a certification system is excellent, but it is also expensive, particularly for the small farmer. So in addition to a certification system, um, thanks to Dr. Sarah, we've also um, implementing and are currently implementing some new rapid multiplication technologies known as single bud technologies. I'll explain it a little bit shortly and Dr. Sarah, I think we'll talk to it. But this is a way to, severe, str to strongly reduce the cost of planting material. So we need to make sure it is cost effective for farmers to be purchasing clean materials that it makes business sense for the farmer. And finally, of course, there's no point implementing new technologies unless we can test them and verify um, that they work in the field in local conditions. So we've been an ongoing R&D effort the entire way, um, entire steps of the process. Now, in addition to production, we can't just solve the production issue. This is a full value chain. So we also need to tackle the business side of it as well, the rest of the value chain. In that regard, we have two other interventions that are going on simultaneously. First is an industry business model. How do we make sure this is cost effective for farmers? What is the marketing plan for this, for the ginger? What is the risk management plan? And what is the operational work plan? So every farmer or every processor getting involved with this needs to know how they will benefit or what the plan, business plan is from their perspective. And finally, public-private partnership. We cannot do this with public sector alone. We cannot do this without private sector farmers as well and, and processes investing in the entire process. So in order to get this operational and which we've been doing, we've needed to work with both the public and private sector together. So let me work, walk you through a little bit more of the technical um, component or the production component a little bit more for those who aren't as familiar um, like I wasn't myself when we began on, on the kind of technologies we're, got, we're building out um, to boost production. Tissue culture of Jamaican varieties um, began back in November last year, where we we're working with three labs. And I'd like you to keep note of the partners here to show you just who we're working with under this pilot. Um, we are working with three tissue culture labs, um, the Ministry's Tissue Culture Labs, as well as the Scientific Research Council and Northern Caribbean University. All of those labs are coordinating and working together to produce clean material of which we are then and have now moved it into a public nursery on the ministry's research station up in Montpellier. Well, as you can see, it's growing out healthy and strong in certified greenhouse conditions. After we will expect to reap this or harvest these rhizomes or this ginger that is now currently being grown in that greenhouse come February next year. And we are anticipating about 80 kilos worth of rhizome. Keep that number in, in mind. That's with good help from the ministry and their research staff up at the research station. Now, this is the new technology. So when come February 2021, our, our private partners being Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances um, and their production partner will take over the material. They will purchase this material from the ministry and will be trained in how to apply this single bud technology. It is a simple technology of cutting rhizomes, mother rhizomes into small buds and then moving the small buds into pro trays of which to grow them out. It means simply that we can take a small amount of mother rhizome and multiplicate it and multiply it so that we actually need less rhizomes to begin with to plant out the same space of field. I'll show you a bit more of that later. After that, 
these newly these platelets will then go into a second round of nursery, but this time with the private sector, um, and they will grow out these um, these single buds um, for another nine months uh, to strengthen them, and then once they reap. Once they reap the harvest from this lot, they will then do the single bud technology again. So a second round of multiplication, which means a small amount of rhizomes keeps being multiplied and multiplied, which means there's a, it can feed into a lot more um, field production. And then finally, come, um, come December or May 2022, so this is the type of, type of framework we're looking at, it will finally, these buds will finally be grown out um, under a certified production system with our private partners. So just to keep notes of everybody who's been working together, either in establishing links with the private sector, supporting the technical trainings with the private sector are here below. So we have the ministry, JACRA, of course, has been very fundamental in linking us to the private sector, as well as RADA will come in and provide support, um, extension support to our farmers once it's in the field. And JACRA is doing um, inspection and monitoring and regulation from, from there on as well. So a whole team effort. As I said, the whole system will be certified. Come harvest, um, we will then be looking from eight, remember from 80 kilos of rhizome when we started, and then two rounds of multiplication, we will now expect to reap 22,000 kgs of rhizome, which when organized and well is going directly into the hands of Caribbean flavors and fragrances. So this has been a, a partnership forged between um, the, our processing partner here, our production partner here, and they've already agreed on the partnership and, and the buying parameters prior to ginger being even put in the ground. So they will also move into oleo resin processing of which Mr. Samuels perhaps can speak a little bit more about because we see good markets opening up for oleo resin. So this whole system is basically, in, in simple words, driving up our yield rate back to where it was in 1960. We also think there's potential that over a few years of trialing and improving our techniques, we can get it up to 25 metric tonnes. So these four, four components combined can have major impact on driving up the yields and, of course, profitability for farmers. Now, just one more point about the new technologies. I wanted to show you how this can dramatically reduce the cost of production. In a traditional planting method, which is happening currently in Jamaica um, with the farmers here, to plant out one hectare of field, um, ginger field takes about 2,400 kgs of rhizome. With the multiplication technologies that's being introduced, that is reduced to 800. So that's a dramatic reduction in private, uh, sorry, in planting material, which means that reduces the cost for the farmer. And by that, I mean the conventional cost of production per kg um, in the current system um, is 130 Jamaican dollars per kg. Under this new certified system, we are expecting the cost of production to drop to $80. So there we save a big savings for farmers, improve their not only um, their efficiency, but their profitability as well. So that's a 40% reduction. So from that, we can easily say, yes, this makes sense for farmers. Just one additional um, point regarding um, building out the, the capacity and the infrastructure of all the, the ministries, agencies that have been involved, the tissue culture labs, the nurseries, the R&D trials. There's been a lot of um, support from FAO in terms of training. This is Dr. Sarah here. And um, a huge amount of building out the technical capacity um, for to enable us to really roll this, um, operationalize this approach. So, these are our two solutions, an integrated approach, first a production, also a business and sort of doing them together. Let's take a little bit of a look at the agribusiness side. What we did in terms of these steps was not too long after the, the work on the technical side began, we also started doing some financial modelling. So we needed to make sure that if we do um, certified production from tissue culture lab to farm gate, we wanted to make sure that it is profitable or viable for farmers. We would never promote a solution that is not viable for farmers. So we did all the modelling um, and it is um, modelling up to the, sec the standard of private sector including cash flow statements, sensitivity analysis. It took about two weeks to build the model, so not too long, but it's been critical in terms of engaging um, the private sector. The one thing I'll also mention is that this model that we are 
we are working with is completely commercialized. So we are, there is no reliance on government subsidization for any of these components. Each component is being paid for in a, in a commercial way, which we think is the most sustainable way to keep this going um, beyond the life of not only the project, but to keep it going um, overall. So what we could see running the numbers or taking the time to run the numbers is we got very strong RRI, return on investment, strong profit margins and strong um, accumulated profits. So what we could see from this model, if a farmer and a processor wants to get involved, there definitely was um, a business case. And again, I'm mentioning um, the partners here was FAO was the main partner to do the modeling, but also we received a lot of support from the ministry, JACRA and JAMPRO. Now, the question then is, how do we target markets? As I, as I mentioned before in the presentation, we're really looking at boosting value addition because we have a lot of processes in the country. So how can we make sure most of the, more of that processing gets done in Jamaica? So we did some mapping as part of the value chain analysis in order to understand how we could increase value addition. At the moment, we're in the currently stand with the supply side crash. We see that most material ends up in the fresh market, but there's very good opportunities in terms of the food and beverage market, oleoresin, and even possibly nutraceuticals in the, mar in, in the future. With that, we identified a players and our, our good partner, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances, interested in this, um, in this work and particularly interested in building, um, building out an oleoresin production here in Jamaica. So with that, it's easy. That's the market we start targeting. Caribbean Flavors, a bit of background on them, is a manufacturer of flavors and fragrances and, and um, produce and distribute a wide net range of food and beverage as well as personal um, cleaning products. Um, they have modern manufacturing and will update their equipment in order to take on um, the oleo resin production. What they needed and what was very clear from our discussions with them starting in April of this year was that they need a consistent source of raw materials. This ginger needs to come in at the right price and that needs to be provided in a stable supply. So this, knowing their needs, that is what we've been coordinating and working towards and hence the reason for a structured partnership. Finally, I just want to make this point about how we manage risks because COVID, in the context of COVID, there's a lot of talk about risk. I want to show you how this work and this way of working actually is tackling not only COVID, but the many risks that are impacting ginger at the moment. And of course, mainly the rhizome rot here. Biosecurity risks is why we need a certification system. We need to work with farmers in good agricultural practices in a hands-on way to improve the production management risks. Irrigation, we are promoting irrigation um, for ginger production. Building out partnerships with processes is the way to manage um, and structure the market and financial risks. And interestingly enough, when COVID hit, um, although it gave us a whole lot of, <laughs> we had to rethink a few things, what I, what I found was very interesting that because the partnership was up and running and we'd already tackled a number of other risks, we we're in a very strong position to handle the risks that came with COVID and the shutdowns and the lockdowns and the move to a virtual um, engagement. Okay, so just quickly to show you what the model looks like, as I was saying, we're starting with the um, public sector um, agencies here who are producing our tissue culture and first generation nursery of our ginger material. These are our key public actors. Ginger is about to move into the private sector hands and this is going to our production partner who is going to work in a combination of once that once they've nursed um, the seedlings will then be um, shared in their own production systems plus potentially working with contract farmers to produce um, 10 hectares of field production which is a target we have for this first round pilot and then of course um, the whole system is certified um, where we're working with the plant quarantine division as well as JACRA to, to inspect and train at each level. And then finally, um, once everything is reaped, it is going to be, well, bought and moved straight over to the processing market. So I want to stress in a public-private partnership that there's no point in doing all this technical work and infrastructure upgrades if we don't have farmers and processors willing to take on the ginger we've produced. Moreover, there's no way that we can convince the private sector to get involved and commit and invest in a certified system unless the public sector operations, the agencies are working well, are coordinated and are delivering produce on time. So in this essence, and I can't stress this enough, everybody is interdependent. We cannot move forward without each other. So one requires the other. 
We've talked about, we're already talking about scaling up because in fact, we've also begun now our second round of this program where we're now starting and working on our second round of tissue culture. We've looked at how, what up infrastructure upgrades we'll need to roll up or scale up so we can include more farmers that have more impact. We, that would mean upgrading both public and then um, working with more private producers as well as private buyers. So I'm nearing the end now. It's a lot. I just want to, for those who might be interested, I just want to uh, sort of show you how this goes down step by step on the ground, how we've done this or built this out. We started with step one because we need to build capacity that we need to have the right public infrastructure in place in order to build a strong foundation from the beginning. So that's training, 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 training. That's research trials to make sure it does actually work on the ground and it's updating the public infrastructure, updating the labs, updating the greenhouses, upgrading um, uh, all, the, all the equipment they would need to operate under a certified system. Once that was going, we then started coordinating and actually getting our public sector partners into production, coordinating the three labs, starting to work on the public nursery. So we started overlapping the two steps. Once these two, once the public se sector seemed up and ready and functional and going in the right direction, that's when we did and started engaging the private sector. So once we knew the foundations were solid, we're there on a better foot to start engaging um, our public private, our private partners and convincing them to get on board with us. And then come step four, that's when we're running. So since, well, since November or early this year, we've been up in implementation mode and so it goes. So just a last comment on the degree of partnerships involved in this, public and private. It's a lot of hands on deck, but every one of these partners has been critical to success. They all provide a service, a knowledge or expertise that we need in order to, to be able to move this thing forward. Without one of them, we would have gotten stopped. So it's a very big shout out and a very big thank you to all the committed partnership, which now that we're up and rolling continues to go. So what they say is good work just begets more work. That is all. It's a quick summary, a lot of information I know. If you are wanting more information, please don't hesitate to contact the FAO Jamaica office, reach out, use the emails. Um, we'd be willing, happy and willing to share. Just let us know. So with that, I'm gonna stop um, my presentation. It is a lot of information all at once, I understand. Um, now I think it is time to turn our work, uh, our discussion over to our panelists. Um, in the meantime, however, I do want to stress that if there's any questions or comments or something is not clear, please write them into the chat box as much as possible. We'll bring them into the discussion. And I also hopefully have one colleague who might be able to um, answer or respond to some of these comments. But now let's turn our time, uh, our focus over to our wonderful panel. Um, my committed partners that we are, um, we know each other well. We've done a lot of work to do together. We've got a lot of work ahead together to continue. Each of our panelists has played a critical role in getting all of this off the ground. So without each contribution that they have made, we would not be where we are today. So it's not only a big thank you, but it's um, now an opportunity to share from their perspective how they've felt or participated about um, this process in itself. So to begin with, and as I said, we're gonna do some opening statements from each panelist, but I'm going to start this by simply asking each of our panelists a couple of questions for them to tackle. I would like to start with Mrs. Michelle Sherwood, our Deputy Director of the Ministry's Research and Development Division. I would like to start with you, Michelle, because I think from um, the presentation, it's very clear that R&D is at the very centre of this work. It is a critical component. And, and from that centre, it has ballooned into something much bigger than we would have ever expected. I think this is super interesting, given the general decline in the region is that expenditure on R&D is on the decline. So I was wondering, I have a question to you. Why, why do you think R&D is so central to this work? And you often talk about this GINGER project as doing R&D differently, that we're taking on a new approach, particularly with R&D. So I'd love your comments on that. Secondly, I'm gonna give you my second question at the same time. Um, I've always believed that technical solution, you can find a perfect technical solution to a problem, but if you don't have the people to lead it, to implement it and to be persistent with it, perfect solutions will go nowhere. From the very inception of this work, you have been a driving and persistent force. You've been convening regular partner meetings, you've been on the phone addressing problems as they come up and you've been connecting departments and agencies. A lot of people, a lot of coordination work and coordination is not easy. 
Could you share some of your reflections on the human side of bringing all of this together? So two questions. Tell us about R&D and why you think this is different and welcome. We welcome your thoughts on the human side. Over to you. You have five minutes. Wow. <laughs> That's a mouthful, Brie. Um, thank you so much, Brie, um, for that um, brief feedback. I want to primarily bring to the fore the importance of research in the development of any agricultural sector. What we have in Jamaica is a very good product, which has had a long history in uh, having a unique niche in the international market and has lost that, that headway that it had in, the, in, in times gone by. We still have the product and for it to get back to that stage is going to take a lot of research. And this is what we have been able to do. We have gained a lot of knowledge based on the diagnostic work we've done here. And as Bria said, the, the underpinning of research has, um, has been very critical in being able to identify what the, problem, what the most cause in the problem in the first place, what was the spread and how um, that has further exacerbated the problem along with climate change. And so based on the environment we're in, the, uh, the, the, the traditional production of ginger in Jamaica would not facilitate us getting back to that, um, that, that way we were before. And so to get there, we had to have what we, I would always say to you, is a paradigm shift. There's no we can do ginger as business as usual and expect to get different results. And I know that saying has been said many times, if you want something to change, it cannot be doing same, the business the same way. You have to change how you do business. And that's what we had set out to do and that was facilitated under the Ginger Value Chain Project. Now here at R&D, we are mandated to generate, promote and transfer technology, bring innovation and partner with agro sectors in order to develop the sector. And that's what we're doing under this um, um, program, this development that we're doing now in Ginger. And key to that has been having a, a, a core group of persons working together who, part, who, who play a major part in, in that value chain. Um, I speak about the, the whole cleaning up of the material to begin with. As you know, ginger had the ginger rhizome rot. It, it wasn't sufficient to use just chemicals alone. We had to introduce or use the tissue culture technology, which through that method were able to remove some of the infection. Um, one of the major um, ways we have been able, we got support under a propel project. Um, and from that, we're able to send some of the ginger to Belgium, which had further helped us to clean up the material. We have together been doing that locally with SRC and NCU and us here at R&D. But with that additional push, um, they were able to add another layer, which had given us back material, which we now can, uh, are using under this pilot. Critical also is not just having the material. We needed to build it up to a sufficient number that would be of make it um, marketable or, or be able to meet the demand that was there in the region um, nationally. So to do that, um, with this recommendation from Dr. Saro, um, when he came on his first or his second mission was for us to work together as a group. He visited all the labs he looked at the infrastructure and, and was able to point out some of the gaps that we had and how best to address them. But what was critical, no one lab would have been able to produce enough material. So that it meant that we had to work together. So that was where the National Tissue Culture Technical Working Group came about as a means of us working together to partner, to be able to produce, um, standardize our methods for one, and to pull together our human resources, as well as our infrastructure to be able to, to, to start this process. And that we were able to do, we have been meeting for the past three years on a monthly basis consistently. Together, we've been able to solve some of the technical issues with the tissue culture ginger, which was very, um, very hard to be honest. Um, each week, each month that they, we, we had meetings, there were issues that we had to deal with. 
And it's not just limited to the material, but also the needs of the different labs. And together we have been able to forge together and be able to solve some, not all, but some of the problems. And um, right now we're able, we have reached a stage we're now working together along with not just the tissue culture lab, we also have our regulatory bodies, um, the plan quarantine um, unit, where we have one body um, represented on the committee to help us to develop that certification program, which Dr. Saro actually implemented the, the certification program provided by Dr. Saro. And so beyond the project, and that's one of the things I wanted to point out, that beyond the project, we had more um, capable persons that were trained and are now able to implement all the um, in information and the training that was given to us. So it's not a project in which we got the information and nothing was done with it. It was it's actually being used and be and it is actually benefiting the development of the sector right now. Critical also to this is now that we research. Research has been critical to inform the business development um, of the, the, the program. Uh, as Bri has pointed out, we have been able to develop the business side of it, but that needed basic information in terms of current productivity. Having cleaned up the material, what is the productivity of that material so that we can have current numbers and not just numbers pulled from old data? We were able to provide current data from our research station in Montpelier, we were able to do both field and greenhouse studies. And that now became the basis on which the information from those work was plugged into a lot of the business modeling that was done um, to build the business case that we're currently utilizing. As a matter of fact, the technology has also been, um, been improved and, and, and made a more climatized, if you want to call it that, in our environment. And we've been able to transfer that information within our division. So now we're at a stage where we can produce enough to be able to better expand on the industry. So just to answer um, further Bree's question, I hope I have, <laughs> we, 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 we are at a juncture now where we, even in the midst of COVID-19 and all that, we have had a number of challenges um, but we were able to overcome them. And that is because of the teamwork that we have been able to build with the private sector. That has made it practical for us to be able to, to be where we are. We have also uh, a, a critical role with FAO and also the private sector. What, what we didn't want to happen was that we have a case in which we are producing material and wasn't being taken up. And now we have that. Uh, a, a private sector entity and others that are coming on board. And, that, and what we found is that the material was not just profitable for the private sector, but it was also profitable for us here at R&D because the material, in, in, in being able to produce the material, it, we had to remain sustainable. And in, in that way, we were able to sell the material and be able to get some money on terms of return on investment in order to support the sustainability of the industry. I believe that's my few words at this time. Thank you very much, Michelle. I've always commended you on how well and how clearly you articulate the case. Very, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, I hear it very clearly that um, no more business as usual. We need to move oh. to something else. And as you said, the business side of R&D always needs to be factored in as yes. well. It has to be, to make it sustainable. Absolutely. I'd like to encourage those who are watching us to not be shy, jump on the YouTube um, comment box. You have three experts sitting in front of you. Please make use of them and ask them the hard questions because this is how we get the best out of this session. Um, okay, I wanna take, I think the best point now is to move from Michelle's interesting and useful introduction to the role of R&D and let's take this a step further um, to the deeper level work that our international ginger expert, Dr. Sara, has been doing and has been working with us since 2017. Um, Dr. Sara, you're an international expert bringing critical knowledge and expertise from your home country, India. 
um, and you've been working not only closely with training under the um, under the under the project TCP project we had here, but you've been lending ongoing support, answering emails, people come up with more technical questions and you've always been there at the ready, like such a willing and committed partner. And I think it speaks a lot in terms of how we move and not move knowledge from one region of the world to the other and then take the slow and gradual steps of ensuring it gets absorbed and uptaken into and institutionalised in another country is there's only so much you can do with one training, but it's about a constant reiterating effort to, to improve the, the, the knowledge at the Tishina Culture Labs, at the production with farmers. Um, you've been a committed process a partner. I think, in fact, I would say that you're almost a rock star here in Jamaica, the amount of times your name comes up in all this work. Um, and I think it, it goes to show that this powerful, the power of technical expertise, not necessarily in moving mountains, but most certainly in moving industries. Um, okay, let's talk ginger. Um, I, my first question, my first of two questions is about certification systems. What is your opinion in terms of the role or the critical role that certification systems need, uh, the, the role certif certification systems have in actually building strong and robust industries for the future? And I say that because you can see from the intervention, the certification component has been complex, has been challenging, and is expensive in its various forms. So where do you think the benefit is? Second, um, I would like to ask you a bit more about the technologies we've been talking about, the rapid multiplication technologies for the planting material, the single bud. Um, there's a lot of talk in the region, in the Caribbean region, about, of course, the low productivity rates, in fact, the lowest in the world, let's be frank, um, and I mean lowest productivity on farms. Um, and a lot of talk about technology as being the silver bullet to this, to this problem. But when we talk about technologies, you often hear of these very sophisticated technologies like drones and remote sensors and robots even. However, what I find very interesting about the ginger case is that the technologies that have been introduced are actually quite simple. They're not very complex and relatively cheap comparatively. So I would be very curious to your response or your thoughts on how we've, there's, I think the combination of both a certification system, simple technologies, it's seeming like in the combination of both or the coupling of those two elements, we seem to have our game changer here, at least for ginger. So uh, with those comments, I, I open the floor to you, Dr. Sara. Thanks very much, Bri, for those nice uh, presentation. I think uh, you, you covered up everything. Um, it, it was really a very good presentation and we have to thank you very much, right? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Bri mentioned in her presentation, um, Jamaican ginger cultivation has uh, two major issues. One is the low productivity, uh, mainly due to ginger, rot dis uh, ginger rhizome rot disease, which is caused by uh, fungal and bacterial complex, as well as sometimes the nematodes also uh, play a major role in causing this disease. Um, here, what happens uh, when farmers, they plant uh, the infected planting material, then again, the rhizome rot, it uh, comes to the new plant and then it becomes a transmission everywhere. So that whenever they cultivate uh, ginger with infected mother uh, planting material, uh, what happens, they also introduce this disease to a virgin soil or else the soil which doesn't have this pathogen. So what we thought um, when I was recruited in this project to work on um, development of a production system, um, we, we just wanted to reduce uh, disease infection in uh, planting material. So for that, uh, we have introduced this technology, single bud technology. And in this single bud technology, what is being done, instead of uh, planting a handful of rhizome in the main field, we could just use a piece of uh, uh, planting material or piece of bud to produce a plant in nursery. And then the those nursery seedlings can be transplanted onto the main field. So that here we are reducing the seed rate, which is a major contributor to the high cultivation of or high cost of cultivation of ginger. For instance, in case of a handful of or in case of a traditional cultivation of ginger, we may need like 40 to 60 gram of rhizome to grow a plant. Whereas in case of single bud technology, we can just have 5 to 8 grams of 
rhizome, which could be used to produce a plant. Using this, we have cut down the cost of planting material. So this is one thing. Then the other thing is when we produce seedlings using single bud technology, we can examine each seeding material and we can ensure that the seeding material is free from rhizome rot disease. So this is another thing. As mentioned by uh, Ms. Sherwood, we have produced the seedlings, the first generation seedlings from tissue culture, the rhizome materials. Then we have used those rhizome materials to produce another generation of rhizome so that we could use that for commercial cultivation under field conditions. So now this technology has reduced the requirement of seed material as well as this has brought the cost of cultivation or this could bring the cost of cultivation down. This is one thing. So using technology, we are able to reduce the cost of cultivation as well as we are able to reduce disease infection. Then what we thought, how to ensure that? Because we have to ensure this quality of producing quality and disease-free planting material. So to ensure that, we thought of a certification system. Then again, certification system, it cannot be done only by the ministry or by the public sector. So here again, we have involved the private partners as well as the government system. The certification system was developed using standards. Then it was implemented. When the certification system is implemented, then we will be able to produce quality and disease-free planting materials. Then that will be supplied to the farmers for cultivation. To ensure quality, the certification system is very much essential. The reason is greater the seed, greater the crop. Without seed, we cannot produce a quality crop. In this regard, this technology and certification system has worked very well, especially in case of ginger, to develop the sector. Then when we go to the cultivation in uh, open field or in main field conditions, then again, the plant or the material which we have produced is a disease-free planting material, but at the same time, it is not a disease resistant material. So we have developed good agricultural practices involving a lot of sustainable uh, pest and disease management strategies, which could be adapted in field under good agricultural practices. And then they could produce and they could uh, uh, um, get good yield as we have done it before. So in this case, involving technology and certification system, we can sustain the production of ginger in Jamaica. And not only that, we can also think of extending this certification system to other crops, such as roots and tubers. Here in Caribbean, we know that we have a lot of cassava and we have a lot of sweet potato, which also has uh, pest and disease issues in which we could think of developing a certification system. Also introducing, yes, simple technology like this single bud technology, which can cut down the cost of uh, seed material production and supply to the farmers. Most importantly here in the Caribbean, we don't have a seed industry. So that's why we are not able to rely on our own um, germ blossoms and seed materials. Once we develop our own seed industry with a certification system to produce a quality planting material or quality seed material, then we can sustainably produce our own crop and we can have our own branding. Yeah, this is, this is the comments from me with respect to certification as well as um, single bud technology system. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarah, for that detailed response. Um, it is much appreciated and you can see the depth of the technical side of this intervention, which is remarkable. I would like to warmly welcome those who've joined us on the channels, on the YouTube or FAO channel. Um, I would also like to reassure you, nothing is wrong. Dr. Sarah is sitting in an incredibly green room. Your eyes aren't um, cheating you by any means. Um, thank you, Dr. Sarah. Um, I, 
you know, Dr. Saro is the whiz kid of this area. So if you have any questions, um, he has a lot of experience. Please put them in the chat box and we will um, we will throw them at him once we open the Q&A. Finally, I would like now to introduce Mr. Guzla McCook, who is the Acting Director General of JACRA. Um, Mr. McCook has often said to me, um, there's no point being a regulator if there is no industry to regulate. I think it's a very fair point. Ginger is in a struggling condition. In honesty, it's not the only crop um, that's in, you know, in a minor crisis and needs support or resuscitation. Um, and not only is JACRA regulating, but it really has the mandate to develop um, the side, do the development side work um, to really bring these industries back to life. So in linking back to the bigger um, main theme of the event being COVID and building back better, we've had the same and persistent residual problems in the Caribbean for decades. We know things need to change. We've been saying that for a long time, but the, are we really equipped to, to drive this change? Mr. McCook, you're a head of an important agency, so you're actually in a position to be able to influence this and advance new thinking and new approaches um, in agriculture in Jamaica. We have spoken and we've been talking a lot in terms of industry business models um, as a new way of looking at and, and obviously in um, actually applying it in ginger, but also starting to look at other crops as well. From your perspective and your long experience in Jamaican in agriculture, is what we are doing in Ginger really a meaningful point of change um, for the for the country? And secondly, um, but also to very much to that point as well, I want to ask you about facilitation. Um, we talk a lot about public-private partnerships, but again, I don't think it's something we know so concretely well. I often feel that in a room where we have both public agencies and farmers and agribusiness representatives, that sometimes we kind of struggle to speak the same language and really understand each other at the level we need to do. You, Jackra, and your team and your very dynamic team has been at the forefront um, of really driving and opening the doors and joining the dots between the public sector who have something very much to offer and then opening the door to industry. Could you give us or share some maybe pragmatic tips on not only how you build or how you see the importance of building a relationship um, towards the private sector, but how then you also go about walking across it. So with that, over to you. Hey, thanks, Bree. Some more full of questions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I would John, Dr. Sarah, in extending commendation to you on the presentation. I think it covered um, the whole gamut of what has been we have been trying to do, in particular with Ginger so far. But what um, Jack and FAO has been working on um, separately to try to build the industry business models for the other commodities which we regulate. As the regulatory body or as the, 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 the authority responsible for regulating, monitoring and facilitating the development of the industries, our first task was to examine the industries to see where they are, what have been um, impacting them, both in development and um, in cultivation practices, and to see where they are in terms of getting the, the moving from just being prime producers into developing that value added um, aspect. Your presentation point to ginger being a highly fresh market product, but has very large um, um, possibilities in the, in the, in the polyuresin um, and nutraceuticals, which are areas which um, our product ginger, turmeric, for example, um, have not been able to tap into and areas that we want to tap into. <clears throat> so Ginger has provided us with the apt, um, opportunity of moving the industries forward. Thankfully, when we came along as JACRA, um, as you pointed out, the FAO has already done some work from 2017 in the examining the industry, seeing where it is, um, where it can go. And so what we have come on to do is try to build on those, um, those um, pointers. It was essential to have that background. Then we, we, we looked at what's happening and how can we move it to the next level. And there we found um, essentially um, and importantly as well, 
um, private partners who are willing to use Jamaican products, but they are not able to get that consistent supply of Jamaican product. And ginger in this case was, was, the, was the situation. So Caribbean flavors have a line of products that they would want to use ginger in, but unfortunately they could not get that reliable supply of, of the product to, to incorporate in their business. Um, the important thing from their perspective is that they wanted to see um, what the, the, the role of government is to do is to provide any of an environment. And as a regulatory body responsible with that charge, we believe we could provide that support in um, supporting the process of the certification. So the certification program having been built, where do you go with that? And to, to, to move that to the next level, we need to have that private partnership um, in cooperation. So what we have been able to do is to build the industry model with, with all the information that is available, take it to the private sector to say, this is what is possible. Where, where are you um, able to, to come on board with us? What is it that you would like to see change or to like to see add to, to what is there? And their involvement in energizing that business model help us now to, to, to create that environment that makes investment much more um, feasible, meaningful from their perspective. So that, that private um, public dialogue now enable us to internalize things and have a public public discussion where we have further discussion with the, the technical director of, of the ministry to point out some of the pointers that the private sector would like to see to enable the environment to be much more meaningful for their involvement. Um, this has created what we now have where the private sector is not only interest, interested, but is committed to play their part in the development of the, in this instance, the ginger industry. But we have seen that being able to extrapolate to other industries we, Dr. Sarah speaks specifically to that certification program, which can be extrapolated. Um, he mentioned some crops, but as we regulate, the crops you regulate, we want to see how that can be extended to those crops. And we see that being able to be used for turmeric, for example, with a certification program that can guarantee the um, presentation of clean planting material with good agricultural practices being um, aligned to it and with committed partners in the production process as well as in the processing process. We believe we can build um, some industries that are resilient. Um, COVID has pointed to the fact that we need to not only produce more, but we need to process more because there came the time when um, external business um, was, was totally at a standstill or more or less at a standstill. Um, with the, especially with ginger turmeric being able to be used in the medicinal aspect of activities and also as um, food processing, processed food, that any would enable us to extend the shelf life of those, of those products, but also to have them incorporate in a much, much further down the value chain which would also generate much more income at a, at, um, for an exchange at a later stage. So it has brought on stream to us the, the importance of having these business models develop, which um, will ignite the interest of private sectors. And an important aspect of it is while Caribbean flavors, as they indicated, wanted those finished products, there was not the consistency to get the production part of it come on stream. Now, what we have been able to do is to link a final processor with an initial, initial producer. And we see what is turning out to be a very good marriage right there. And it's also something I would like to have extend to the other crops you regulate. But if it can be a lesson learned for um, the wider agricultural sector, and maybe even the wider Caribbean, where meaningful discussions in meaningful involvement of the private sector at an early stage and to have them involved in the discussion so that you don't just give them something but you allow them to be part of something that they want to be a part of 
it can have a meaningful um, evolution of the agro processing, agro industry sector. Thank you very much, Mr. McCook. Very wise words, and I think we are very much on the same page and speak the same language, or we've been learning how to speak the language of the private sector as well, which in itself has been part of this process. Okay, now with the formal statements done, formal-ish, I want to take um, questions from the floor. Admittedly, we have a very shy audience on YouTube. Shame. That just gives me more opportunity to um, <laughs> to steer the ship, so to say, and provoke our panellists um, with my own questions um, that we have. What I'm going to do um, in the remaining 20 minutes that we have for this webinar is to start with three questions, and then I'm going to turn the floor over to you gradually one by one, of which you can choose to take whichever question you so desire or speak at random. <laughs> i also give you that freedom. Uh, we did have one question come in from the chat box um, from a Dr. Persaud, I can see. That is with regards to, is there a disease resistant variety for ginger? Um, or is there more research needed? Or is it that we really need to orientate our work towards managing the disease rather than eradicating, eradicating the disease? So any comments you may have on that would be appreciated by our audience. Um, the next, another question I would like to raise is how could certification benefit small farmers? Because as we said, as I said in the introduction, we're talking about a farmer base that's 80% 80, 80 small, right? And small farmers have their very unique um, constraints. They don't have a huge amount of financing. Um, they're often away from major thoroughfares or infrastructure, um, you know, in some cases wedded to traditional practices. So how can we encourage or how, how is, is this applicable? Is a certification um, approach applicable for small farmers? Because I think that's also the crux of change for Jamaica. We need to get the small farmer on board if we are really to see um, drive change in the industry and for farmers and agriculture as a whole. Finally, as a third question, I want to take the, the, the conversation a little bit back to the private sector um, because we as panelists or and, and as teams, as a team have been sitting together for many months working together and we've been very um, excited about what we've been developing, very committed and very focused. The difference um, about our proposal or, or the proposal that we are working with in terms of this public-private partnership is it's not us that has to put our money behind it, it's the private sector. So I would ask, why is it that you think um, the private sector has been so convinced to actually um, back this project and in turn and put in, put in, you know, the financing required to set up greenhouse nurseries, to put irrigation systems, to run farms? Um, it's not, it's not any cost to sneeze at. So what is it that we had um, in our approach that you think tipped, tipped the coin on this and and got their interest? So those three questions um, again. Disease resistant varieties, how does certification um, benefit small farmers? And why is the private sector putting their money behind this um, initiative? So with that, maybe we'll take the order of the same order we did. Um, Michelle, Mr. Sherwood, Dr. Sarah, Mr. McCook, over to you. Okay, thank you, Bree. Thank you, Bree. Yeah. Oh, um, oh I was okay. just... Michelle, what do you want to go? Okay, go um, ahead. Uh, well, I'll start and then you can add after. Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, in terms of resistant development for ginger, there is currently a project being implemented by the Scientific Research Council, which is um, an agency that is part of our technical working group, the Urban Independent Project with the International Atomic Agency, where they are working to find or to develop a resistant um, ginger. So we anticipate that what we're doing now serves as the um, multipliers, um, the, the value chain, the whole certification program that we're currently implementing, using what we have, I started the ball rolling and I set up the system for multiplication and, and the connection to the private sector. It, it's not going to be, um, once the, 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 the variety or the type has been developed, we then can incorporate that into the system and then move it into the private sector using the same certification system. So the current um, development is ongoing and they are currently working on it. It's just for a matter of time. 
And with that, we, we hope to be able to work together in able, uh, with the certification program to build it out to the private sector and to make it a part of the industry. Dr. Saro? Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. With respect to resistant genes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, here, the issue is, um, it's, it's a difficult to find a resistant gene against complex of pathogens because it's not a one particular pathogen affecting ginger. Uh, here, what happens is a fungal pathogen called Pythium and Fusarium, as well as a bacteria called Ralstonia. So all of them is a complex process. So one single gene may not do the gimmick and also is identification of that particular gene is a very difficult process. So what we are doing here is um, um, to manage the problem with the uh, production of disease-free quality planting material, as well as sustainable practices. That is... Uh, key here in this uh, project. In addition to that, um, as a um, strategy for future, simultaneously, the research institutions such as uh, NCU, as well as UWI and the research division of the Ministry of Agriculture, and they will be continuously evaluating uh, the gene blossoms for its resistance. And if they have any resistance, then uh, in addition to that, we have to identify uh, the quality parameters of those particular variety, whether it can be uh, used for commercial cultivation because ginger jamaican ginger is very popular because of this ginger oil and other bioactive compounds so we have to make sure that once the variety which we develop has that property then it can be used for commercial cultivation so that is my response with respect to resistance to rhizome rot disease then the second question is why is certification uh, important for small farmers and how they can cope up with the certification system. And here what happens, the certification system for producing quality planting materials and it can uh, it can be done either by small farmers or by nursery producers. And here for first instance, let us consider that the uh, private nursery producers, they involve in certification system because there is a system and they should have an infrastructure facility and they, 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 have to, they, they have to adhere to all the guidelines and they have to follow uh, the standards. And within that standards, the rhizome material is produced for um, uh, planting. So here what happens, uh, if small farmers, they cannot afford to produce the quality planting materials by themselves, in that instances, they can get the planting material from the private nursery producers. And also here what happens, as I told you, in case of conventional um, ginger cultivation, if you wanted to cultivate one hectare, then you need like two, 1500 kg of seed material so that is high but whereas here in this case what happens in case of single bud technology 500 kg of planting material is sufficient to produce seedlings to grow or to cultivate in a hectare of land so by this way the small farmers they will be able to afford the price to buy the planting materials or the seedlings from the nursery producers and by that way, they can benefit and they can adapt to the guidelines developed as per good agricultural practices. And of course, the support such as micro irrigation and other support, it has to come from the government or from uh, the private sector, because here we are uh, trying to develop the contract forming system so that even the small farmers will be in that contract system and so that they will have support, technical support from the extension agency as well as the other uh, support from the government and the private sector so that the small holders or the small farmers, they are not left alone. They will be involved in this contract forming and so that it is, it is a, uh, a system. Uh, this is uh, one way. And the other possibility is if a small farmer, if he or she wanted to involve in production of quality planting material, then they can also uh, do it by in off, off a hectare land is sufficient or even um, um, not off a hectare, sorry about it. It says often acre of land is sufficient to produce 
um, quality planting materials and they, they can supply it to many uh, farmers using that and that could be a viable system. Um, so the small farmer can also involve in the production of quality planting materials. So it has different stages, tissue culture, and it can be done by the uh, uh, public uh, uh, research institutions like Ministry of Agriculture and uh, uh, Scientific Research Council, as well as uh, NCO. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, tertiary institutions like uh, UWI, and they can produce uh, tissue culture plants. And that goes to the next stage, wherein um, the private uh, nursery producers, they involved in the production of those seedlings. Then it goes to the farmers for commercial cultivation under field. So small farmers, they can involve in uh, um, uh, um, nursery production, as well as they could involve in commercial production of the ginger. So there is more possibilities and um, uh, this uh, ginger value chain has flexibility to involve um, different uh, uh, size of producers, whether it is a small farmer or it's a medium farmer or it is a um, large farmer. Okay. Um, I'd like to add to what Dr. Sarri enforced actually. Um, what is central um, to this program is that we're building what we call the relationship between the private sector and the small farmers to ensure that the production takes place, to also ensure the standards are kept, but also to ensure funding that will be needed for production and to make the system sustainable for the long-term takes place. In Jamaica, we have what is called the mother farm model, where there is a building a contract relationship between the farmer and the private sector, where the funds that are provided are are, are utilized by the, farm, the farmers to do cultivation, but also the, when you are at the end of the contract, the sales from that, goes, the, the product goes to the um, producer who then pay the farmer, but also ensures that inputs are also kept for them to use in the second cycle. So there is a cycle which is kept. So what is central to this is that it's, it's the, farmer, the small farmer benefits is best done when there's a close relationship with the private sector to ensure market sustainability, but also adherence to the certification model, which is critical for management of the disease. When we have a farmer who buys the material and then takes it on his own to produce it, there becomes the issue of the sustainable component, one for market, but also to ensure that the disease is managed. And so we heavily depend on the farmer's relation, um, public sector relationship to keep, to find that paradigm shift that I keep talking about. What we're used to is a farmer on their own doing things. And we don't, we want a more cooperative um, system going forward where there's a close relationship and a, 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 a standards kept at all um, levels, including at the small farm location close relationship with the stakeholders in the RADA, JACRA, to ensure that certain protocols are kept. In that way, it protects so far, reduces the risk to rise from rot, and also to ensure that the system remains sustainable and beneficial, um, both productivity and also to reduce the risk to the rise from rot. So I just to reinforce what Dr. Sarah is saying, um, to ensure that, they, that those who are listening understand that we are trying to build a chain and there we don't want, and we are encouraging persons to come on board to join a chain. In this way, the system or the, 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 the um, chain that we're developing remains sustainable and therefore reduce the risk to the rhizome rot uh, reinfections. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. Mr. McCook. The last speaker. All right. Um, the, 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 smart, the certification program is supported by uh, a good agricultural practice system, which, as it was pointed out, while the, the plant and material is not disease resistant, um, the, 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 the system you try to cultivate it or encourage the cultivation in an environment that is clean which will support the, the cleanliness of, of the producing material right throughout. Small farmers are critical to the agricultural process. You point out the, 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 the large number of small farmers. 
that there is in our um, system, Bri. Um, you referred at the beginning of your presentation to the sustainable development goals, in particular that of um, poverty reduction and hunger reduction. And I'll also add to that um, the issue of climate resilience. Ensuring that small farmers are involved in the cultivation process will only help to alleviate those three or help us to fulfill those three um, um, sustainable development goals. And what, why we were critical to our, our um, significantly, significantly trying to get the private sector involved in the process and is to ensure that the, the, the production chain can be sustained by having a secure market and a secure production um, or secure produce, producers coming through. Because that is what we found have been lacking. There has been the demand on the one end and then the production is not coming through. And then when farmers recognize that there's a demand, then there's a, 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 a rush to the production. So there's an ebb and flow in the production process which is not what is required for the, any sustainable development of any sector. So what we, we want to do is ensure the participation of the, of the small farmers through the certification, through good agricultural practices. The, one of the other limiting factors that has, has been affecting um, small farmers and farmers in general is the issue of living income. Without the farmer being able to make a living from what he's doing. It is not going to encourage him to be fully participating. And that's gonna impact productivity. It's gonna impact production in the long run. So with the certification program and the good agricultural practices being executed, that should reduce the farmer's input costs. And with, with that, uh, and the clean planting material increases productivity and by extension increases overall income, which should add to his, um, an increase in his living income, which would make his life much better and make him more encouraged and want to participate in the production process. Why should um, private sector be enthused and want to be part of the process? One, I think they, they are seeing the, um, the, the, the environment that they want to be, the enabling environment being prepared for them. And what are these? The presentation of the um, certified planting material um, at a cost that they can afford. Um, the market is there for them to, to, to go through. And then there is the, 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 the public support through extension, through monitoring, through regulation. You point to the, 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 the um, falsification of Jamaican products all over Brie. That's something that we want to look at carefully to see how, as the regulatory body, we can bring that under some sort of a, of a, of a management that would enable the product to give much, have much more um, relevance in, in the marketplace and much more relevance to those who are producing it. So the private sector has seen efforts to make the gender sector, for example, much more um, investor friendly through the certification, through the training that is, is, is have, have come and is to come. And through the, the, the um, overall regulating and monitoring and, and, and the industry business model, which was critical to, to give them the figures and to show what is likely if they follow the um, steps outlined and, and, and become a part of the process. That's, that's my presentation. <laughs> Brie, are you there? Her signal. Okay, let's wait for her, please. A uh, moment. Okay. Until she joins us. Um, just to continue the conversation until she joins us. 
Right. Um, critical to as um, to the program is a continued research. Um, right now, we one of the things we're trying to do is to strengthen the um, research in terms of providing more plant health component to it. We have further expanded the work that we're doing now um, to identify biologicals. Uh, control component to our program. And with the plant health with Dr. Sarah again, we hope to get to that. Um, that in this way, we're able to strengthen the good agricultural practices that we're currently implementing to ensure that whatever we put in the field is productive. Um, the point I wanted to add to uh, just listening to the, the conversation is that um, the, in Jamaica, a lot of our small farmers live in rain-fed locations. And the project, that they, the use of the single bird technology requires adequate irrigation because we're using a smaller rhizome. And what we want to point out that the partnership that we desire to have, irrigation is provided as part of the program to ensure that it is, what is needed to grow the crop will be adequate and ensure a successful crop. Um, and also to use climate change, smart technology, water harvesting, and all of that will be part of the pilot program we're currently seeking to implement. Um, so going forward, we do see where the small farmer will benefit and be able to produce despite the challenges with climate change and also to profit and be able to, the, to, to earn an income that will be able to, to continue their livelihood, take care of their families, and also be able to maintain a sustainable business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. Thank you, Mr. McCook. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. I think that's the most comprehensive response you'll ever get to those questions. Um, I'm now just keeping an eye on time. We're moving into wrap up, but I think it's pertinent to give each of our panelists just an opportunity to say, to take one or two sentences to share their key messages or closing thoughts on this. We've covered a lot. Um, and as Dr. Sarah pointed out in a, in a meeting about a month ago is that now we're transitioning from actually moving our certified ginger from the public into the private hands. And he made the very important point that this is where the hard work begins. We think we've done the hard work and we've been working furiously, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure it all stays in order and um, implement is implemented successfully. Can I ask you all now to just share a few comments and share your key messages on the work that's been done, but particularly in regards to perhaps what are your hopes for this work, for Ginger or for this kind of approach um, moving forward um, and what you would like our audience um, to critically take away. So maybe I'll reverse the order a bit. Let's start with Dr. Sara, then Mr. McCook and end of course with our lovely female panelists, Mrs. Sherwood. So over to you and if you could be short so that uh, we can wrap up. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. So the first thing is we have to support the certification system and then demonstrate technology for sustainable production of ginger, because ginger has potential um, for production as well as marketing and processing in uh, Jamaica as well as overseas, then keep strengthening value chain and uh, bring all actors into value chain and uh, ensure that um, we have flexibility to accommodate everyone and support everyone uh, because partnership is the key here. Then extend the same model to other uh, crops, key crops, such as uh, cassava and sweet potato and turmeric, and to some extent in coconut as well. Because um, again, I wanted to emphasize that uh, greater the seed, greater the crop. So seed is the basic input. So we have to produce quality planting materials and we have to uh, ensure that we have a good seed industry to supply quality seeds for all commercial crops. So in that way, we can um, extend and we can think of developing different certification systems for other commercial crops as well. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, the industrial business model is the key to providing the, the private sector with the enabling environment, which they, they sort of require and, and, and what mostly needed to invest in an industry. The certification system, which enables the provision of clean planting material, 
that can be extrapolated to, to many crops. Um, the insurance of the good agricultural practices to ensure that that certification system is utilized to its best. And the provision or the assurance of the value added aspects of the use of those producing material, those produced material is what is key to enable private sector to want to be interested and want to be part of a system. This requires the full participation of the public sector to, to liaise amongst one another who brings different um, aspects of their, of their activities into play and to provide the, the private sector with that leadership which they require from the public sector. We have demonstrated that that is possible because that has brought on stream investors. In Ginger now, there is growing interest for, um, from investors for turmeric. And as we roll out the other um, industry business models, we are sure that other um, investors will want to come on board because they have seen a plan, they have seen a pathway that they would want to be a part of. So the industry business model is key, we think, and, and the um, enabling environment is essential to supporting the, the development of such industry business models going forward. Yes, um, again, uh, for any industry, agriculture industry to grow and be sustainable, it has to be underpinned by um, research and um, not just research, but applied research that will answer the problems that um, are causing the decline in the first place. And this requires us to find um, innovations that are not just innovations just for innovation's sake, but are cost effective and practical um, for the business model to ensure that whatever is being put out for the value chain to absorb will make business sense and also answer um, many of the problems that um, caused it in, in the first place. Secondly, partnerships. It is critical that all involved, they have close partnerships to ensure that we understand each other, we understand our role and be able to support each other in getting the job done. If we do this individually and separately, it won't get done. In a country like Jamaica, we're a small country, it is best that we work together, and that has been working so far, to be able to meet the demand that currently is out there, and we are growing as a result. Also, I would like to reinforce the importance for training and retraining to ensure that the knowledge gain is not lost. The current program, we've done a lot of training and are also doing manuals as well to ensure that the information exists for all who are interested to be a part of the program and to also ensure the sustainability of the program, to ensure that the, um, the, the private sector gets the support from the public sector that they need to make business uh, profitable for them. And by extension, I, go, I, I reinforce what um, I heard Mr. Makoka said, we have found that what we have learned from this program has now become, has opened our eyes to what's possible for other programs. And I've already started to use the information um, to not just do research for research sake, but also ensure what, what we are doing make business sense. And for that reason, we anticipate that the benefits of this program will all go well for us being able to develop other um, sectors that currently need the same cert similar certification program to make them uh, successful and also sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you to you all. Um, I think you, together, there were very clear, straightforward, and strong messages about the work we are doing. I don't think I have anything left to say, and I don't think I could have said it any better. So thank you to all. I'm looking at the time now. It is time to wrap up. I want to extend my biggest thank you and gratitude to our panelists. Um, not only for today's webinar and taking the time out of your schedules, but for the continued work and journey we are taking on this work. Your commitment, your persistence and leadership is critical. FAO is a very much um, a supportive partner and, a, and more than anything from my side, it has been a pleasure to work with you because it's, it's great to see something moving forward and everybody playing a part in driving that forward. 
Um, I would also like to thank um, our IT support online and also in particular our interpreter who our interpreters who I think have had their work cut out for them this session with all the quick um, interpretation. Very much thank you for that. And finally and lastly, thank you to you for joining us um, via YouTube or the FAO website. Um, I can see that we've had participants or audience from across definitely the Caribbean region, but also as far afield as Canada, Bangladesh and Honduras. We are grateful for the time. Thank you for joining us. Um, remember, and just a quick reminder that this recording will be online as well as if, if you want to pass it on to any of your colleagues who you think might be interested. And for any more information about ginger, if you're interested in investing and becoming a farmer, um, ginger farmer in Jamaica, because you've seen how profitable it is, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And the best way to do that is to contact us by the FAO Jamaica uh, website. So once again, thank you to you all. And um, from us now, take care um, and of course stay safe so over and out thank you to you all <laughs> okay Yes. yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you very Thank much, you. everyone. Okay.